morning we're going to continue in our series called Timber, Watching Your Giants Fall. And this particular week we're going to be addressing a giant that is going to sound a little bit different. It's called the giant of comfort. Now, how many of us like to be comfortable? Well, I think each and every one of us could raise our hand and say, we enjoy comfort. As a matter of fact, I think that many of us strive for comfort, maybe even to a fault where we make that our destination. We want to live life out of comfort, and we make decisions based upon what makes us comfortable more than it is about what's right or wrong. So I want you to just hang with me today as we talk about this giant of comfort. We're going to be referencing 1 Samuel 17 in the story of David and Goliath, as well as jumping over to the book of Luke. But when we're talking about the giant of comfort, let me, let me start with saying how many of you enjoy going to the dentist? Now, not many of us do. I myself am one of those people that do not uh, enjoy going to the dentist because it seems like every time I go, without fail, they're going to find a cavity. And then they're going to have to drill. And since I was a young boy, there was just such a fear of, of having to go to the dentist and having to face uh, this destination of, of having to have my tooth drilled. You know what I would do? Even though I knew when I got older and I knew I should go to the dentist, I would put it off. You know why? Because I didn't want to be discomforted. I didn't want to be put in a position where things would be uncomfortable. Therefore, I would choose to say it's more comfortable to not go to the dentist. But how many of you know that that only leads down a bad path? It creates more decay, and there's more damage, and there's more cost involved. Well, so it can be in our life. If we don't look at what's right and identify what's wrong and then make the right choice, we can end up choosing to just try to live in a life of comfort, which is a destination that we say, we just want to remain here at all costs. Now, don't get me wrong. God wants us to live a comfortable life. Uh, the Bible's very clear that he came to give life and to give it abundantly. He wants to fill your heart with, with love, with peace, with joy. But he also said in this world, you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. So God wants us to experience comfort in life, but we're going to have times where we'll have struggles and we will need to know the difference between right and wrong. And the only way we're going to survive that is to have a standard of truth, which is the word of God. Uh, this world tries to define, define truth, not on absolute truth, but relative truth, which means um, it may be true for you, but it's not necessarily true for me. And, and when you live that kind of a life, what, what kind of a standard? Uh, you have so many different definitions. The absolute truth, the standard, is to be the Word of God. So again, don't get me wrong, God's desire is that we can be comfortable, but not at the cost of compromising. Many times when it comes to giving, we want to be known as givers, don't we? Without actually having to give. <laughs> Why? Because in order to actually give, there's a cost that's attached to that. But it's when you pay that cost. Do you know that when you give uh, from your heart, whether that means giving financially or whether that means uh, giving of your time <clears throat> or maybe it means giving of your talents, when you do that, that is actually an act of worship. 2 Samuel 24, 24, uh, I remember says something to this degree. He says, I won't give to my God something that doesn't cost me anything. In other words, it's, it's going to have a cost attached to it. Sometimes we will be uncomfortable. Don't let the giant of comfort keep you from moving forward with what God wants for your life. You know, it can be difficult, can it, to think of comfort as a giant, though? It really can. I guess another way to put it would be... Uh, to be complacent. Uh, when we get comfortable or complacent, we can start uh, compromising in areas of our life. When we think of comfort, it's usually good things, right? Um, sitting back. Let me, let me just define comfort for me. Comfort would be sitting back and relaxing with the family, uh, sitting in a hammock on the beach while listening to the waves as the sun goes down, while tiki torches are lit in the background. It's walking along the beach. It's a perfect 89 degrees. There's sand between our toes. Uh, for me, it's sitting in a recliner and watching some TV and enjoying a good movie. Comfort can be defined many different ways. And none of these things are deadly in and of themselves. But trouble can arise when we desire for those examples uh, that we gave earlier to become greater than obedience to God. That's what God's after. 
is obedience. You see, when a relaxation mentality supplants our attentiveness to God and His call on our lives, then that comfort can become a giant in our lives, and it will start to call the shots. This is why the giant of comfort, by the way, can be one of the scariest giants of all, because it's so subtle, and it's very deceptive, and it sneaks up on you, and it says, don't worry about it. You can pay it later. You can do it later. You can make a decision for the Lord later. It's always going to tell you to do it later because you need to enjoy the here and now. This is why the giant of comfort can be one of the scariest giants of all because it's so subtle and deceptive in all of its doings. When the giant of comfort is calling the shots, it can cause us to miss the very best that God has for us because we settle for good instead of settling for God's best. You know, on the surface... Things can look very good, but it's, it's underneath the surface where the heart is at. Um, maybe you can identify with having wanted something, and it looked perfect on the outside, but after you got into it, it, it got kind of ugly. Maybe it was a house that you wanted to purchase. It's the perfect house. It's the perfect price. And then you bought it, and three months into it, it's become quite a money pit, or there's problems that it's creating in your life. I know for me, it, was, uh, it came true in the form of a Chevy Monza Spider. I don't know if you're familiar with that kind of a car, but it's kind of like a Camaro that blows up, and this is one of the little pieces. And I wanted this car so bad. It was a stick shift. It had a, uh, uh, it had a Hemi in it. It had the spoiler in the back with the fin, and it just looked amazing, and I wanted that car. I had been given some advice to not take the car, but I did not heed that advice because I felt comfortable purchasing this car. I was going to look good. The problem came in after I bought it, when the transmission had problems, the engine had problems, and things started to break down. That which I thought looked good was now not so good. I had been given advice that you might not want to get that car, but I didn't listen to the advice. Now I got what I wanted, but I don't want what I got. You know, the same can be true when we don't seek the Lord and use the Word of God as a standard. What happens is, is God can speak to us and He'll say, don't take that job, don't get involved in that relationship. Or He may encourage you in a job, or encourage you in a relationship. But if we're not listening to him, uh, we won't hear him. And when God speaks, it's because he's got something to say, and he wants to bless us, and he has promises for our lives. Don't settle for just good. Settle for God's very best. See, there's nothing wrong with having a good job, is there? there there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with having a, a good spouse. There's nothing wrong with having a nice family or having a routine in your life. The problem comes in when we don't look at the bigger picture. In the bigger picture of life, think about this. We have five seconds on earth to make our life count. Think about that. In the grand scheme of it all, the big picture, we have about five seconds to leave our mark on this world and being comforted, comforting others, and even experiencing the touch of comfort in life is not bad in and of itself. It's when comfort becomes a giant and starts to call the shots in our life. You know, maybe you can identify as we've been talking about some giants, uh, some areas where you've become comfortable and you've chosen to stay there uh, because you don't want to face reality or you don't want to face the truth or you don't want to be disappointed or, or let somebody down. Don't let that giant call the shots in your life. Don't let it be the one that directs you because it will leave you no longer being led by the Holy Spirit. You'll be led by what comfort is and is not according to you. Let the Word of God and His Holy Spirit lead you and direct you. Remember in week one, when we started with this series, it was called My Pet Giants or My, uh, My Little Giants. In other words, we were talking about how do we get these giants in our life, like uh, unforgiveness or, or addiction or anger or worry or anxiety. How do they become giants in our life? They become giants because we befriend them when they're little, and then they grow in our life. So we said in week one, a giant is a problem or a person that looms so large that it intimidates you, and it causes you and I to fear. That's what a giant is. And when we fear, and we filter life through how it makes us feel, then comfort becomes the giant that starts to control our life. It, let me give you a few ways that comfort can become harmful, because if you're like me, when I started thinking about this and praying about it, I started thinking, I don't really see how comfort can be a giant. I don't see how comfort can be a problem, but let me give you a few ways that comfort can become harmful. 
Uh, by choosing a safer route, comfort, we can miss out on greater opportunities. That's one way it can ha be harmful to us. Uh, a good thing that over time actually becomes harmful, what it will do is it will lull you into a false sense of security. You think everything's fine when deep down you know every, everything's not. That's where the giant of comfort will lead you. When we choose good things and miss out on the God things, then we know that a giant is calling the shots in our life. When we buy into a mentality that if we work hard for a season, when that season's over, we can do whatever we want with the rest of our lives. That can become a giant. Now, let me pause just there a moment. Because I know that some of you, when I said that, said, hey, what's wrong with that? If I work hard and I retire, can I just enjoy the, the, the fruit of my work? Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you're here and you've retired and you're now enjoying that season, please enjoy it. But don't think that God's done with you. You're just in a new season. God still has a plan for your life. Here's another way that it can become a, a giant in our life. When we have a mindset that says, it's my life. I can do whatever I want. Now, the reality is, is your life is your life. But the life that you have, you have because God gave it to you. And God gave you that life as a gift. Remember, five seconds is really our mark on this world. What are you going to do with those five seconds? Are you going to let comfort call the shots? Or are you going to let God's spirit call the shots? Here's another way is, it, is when my guiding compass is whatever makes me happy. When we live life based on whatever makes me happy, it, that can become a fairly shallow life. When comfort is sought out first, before we make ourselves available to God's plans, that can become a giant. Are you seeing the many different ways that sometimes we live life out of comfort rather than by the promises that God has given us? That's the danger of comfort. And that's why comfort can be such a deadly giant. Yet too often, we have settled for comfort, and the comfort ends up doing us in. You know, <clears throat> I think of when a bird, let me just use an eagle as an illustration. When an eagle uh, has a young one, and it's hatched, and it's in the nest, that, that, that little tiny baby eagle gets to sit in the nest, and it gets to be, uh, it gets to relax. Uh, mom will go out and find the food and bring it back and feed the baby. The baby gets to chill in the nest, right? Um, mom will protect the baby. Baby doesn't have to do much of anything. But there comes a time when Mama Eagle gives that little baby eagle the, the left foot of fellowship and kicks that baby eagle out of the nest. Now, I'm sure running through the mind of that baby eagle as it plummets downward is, why would my mom do this? I don't understand this. Life was going so good. I was so comfortable. Now, we all know that Mama Eagle's not going to let the baby hit the ground. Mama Eagle will swoop in and will catch that bird if it refuses to fly, take it back to the nest. But you know what Mama Eagle does? Kicks it right back out. And will continue to do so until that little baby eagle learns to fly. You know, sometimes we don't realize how much God has blessed us and provided for us. Uh, we forget to thank Him for the little things. And there may come a time when you feel like the world itself, maybe even God, is kicking you out of a place of comfort. But it's never to bring harm to you. And it's never to bring destruction. It's so that you and I can learn that we have wings and we can fly. Not because of how good we are, but because of how good God is. <clears throat> when I was younger, uh, about 1990, uh, 95 and 96, Lisa and I were kicked out of our place of comfort. Let me give you a little picture of what that might look like. I had grown up in, I was born and raised here in Clinton, Iowa, and uh, I was here till the age of about 22 years old, and there came a point in time when I felt like the Lord was calling me into ministry, and when he called us into ministry, he placed Christ for the Nations Institute on our hearts, Dallas, Texas, <clears throat> and when I felt that the Lord said, it's time to go, within three months, we were in school. I mean, it happened fast. It was just rapid, and so... We applied for school, we packed up our house, we left, and we now found ourselves in the suburbs of Dallas, Texas, wondering how in the world we got here. What happened to us? I remember many nights sitting around with very little furniture, <clears throat> very little food, wondering, what was I doing here? I had it made when I was back home, and I was kicked out of my comfort place. But you know what that did for, for me and what it did for us is it put us in a complete environment for God to reveal and to flourish in our lives. 
You see, we were in a different atmosphere where though we were scared, we were afraid, we didn't know what the next day was going to look like, were we actually going to make it through school, were we going to find a job, where was our income going to come from, we had all these things that worried us. But because we were in an environment where change was going to take place, the Holy Spirit empowered us. The Holy Spirit provided for us so that we could learn that if we just have an ear to hear Him, He would provide for us and He would lead us. Now, that was a very scary situation. But what God was doing was He was calling us to live a life out of faith. Um, Many of you have had similar situations where God has spoken and He said, You may not have all the answers right now, but are you going to do what it is that I've called you to do? You've got a choice. Are you going to live by faith or are you going to live by facts? That choice will always be there for us. Let me read to you from Luke chapter 12, an instance in the Bible that kind of lays this out for us. It says in Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 16, that he spoke a parable to them. This is Jesus speaking to the people, and he said this, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he He thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater ones, and there there I will store all of my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have so many good things laid up for so many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will these things belong to which you've provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. He called, God called that man a fool. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to have to stand before the Lord when he asks me what I did with what he's called me to do. And I don't want to have the Lord call me a fool. How about you? You know, that's one of the last things you want to hear coming out of his mouth. But what we see here in the Word of God is that a man was looking at all the things that he had and tried to figure out ways to store them up for himself. And what God wanted him to do was to take that which he's been blessed with and learn what it means to bless others. What God is trying to get us to see here is that it's okay to be blessed, but in God's kingdom agenda, we are so blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. He has a greater purpose for us. And he knows how easy it is for us to just eat a good meal, relax with a nice drink, and forget about the brevity of life here on earth. But in 1 Samuel chapter 17, um, we have David there, and he's facing a giant. And in verse 16, it says, The Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. This giant kept showing up twice a day, 40 days, and kept putting the people down. And for 40 days, the children of Israel were held back by comfort. They would, they, they, they would let the giant call the shots. The Israel army would come out and they would face the giant and they would shout their war cries and then say, nope, not today. And they would go right back because they're not feeling it. They wanted to go back to that place where it was comfortable. We don't know what will happen if we go out there and take on Goliath, but we know what will happen if we just remain where we're at. And that feels much safer. That's comfort. You see, and God had spoken, given them a promise. He had, he had told them that, that He was their God and that He was not only behind them, but He was before them. And when David shows up on the scene, he accomplished in one day what his three older brothers and the whole army of Israel hadn't been able to do for a month and a half. Israel was wavering, and their comfort held them back. And David said, this is crazy. This is nuts. And this is going to end today. And what wasn't happening in the last 40 days was now going to happen in the next 40 minutes, because David was getting ready to take on that Goliath. And it makes me wonder, when David shows up on the scene, and he sees Uh, the children of Israel wavering for 40 days, and then he goes out and accomplishes in 40 minutes. Is that because David's so great? No. It, It wasn't about David. It was about the God inside of David. He had more faith in God than than the army of Israel was looking at their abilities. They were looking at their weapons. They were looking at their generals and their sergeants and their captains. David was looking to God. And he was able to accomplish in 40 minutes what they couldn't in 40 days. And it makes me wonder this. What could God be wanting to accomplish 
in just these 40 minutes that we have here together? What is the Lord speaking to you right now that he says, you know what? That's you. That there's things I've been telling you to do. Don't, don't be afraid. Step out in faith. You see, the new direction that God calls us into may not feel familiar. It, it may be uncomfortable at times or at first. We don't need to learn how to fly before we jump out of the nest. What matters most is that we understand that we move in God's strength. I want to give you four truths today about facing this giant of comfort. Four truths that will help us uh, frame up a mindset so that we can step forward. Maybe today God's calling you to, to a different season in life or a different job or a different place. Maybe it's just in your spiritual growth. God's calling you into a deeper, more intimate relationship with him, but you've been afraid to step out there. And, and what, what, these are four truths that will help hold us up when the world and the enemy tries to put us down. Number one, write this down. Faith thrives in holy discomfort. Faith thrives in holy discomfort. In the book of Hebrew, chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. See, in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it doesn't establish a lot of comfort there, does it? The way that we would define comfort. Because the, de the, the development of faith means that we must step out in faith into things that we can't see, things that we don't understand. Uh, the gospel, by the way, the Word of God, is rooted in a place of discomfort, Christ's discomfort, not ours, but Christ's. In the cross, it brought pain to Jesus. In the same breath, it brought freedom to us. You see, we're alive today because of the discomfort that Christ went through. Christ endured what was uncomfortable so we would become the sons and daughters of the Most High God. This is our story. This is what Christianity is based upon. It's about a Savior who came, who died, and rose again. Uh, all in an arena, an environment of discomfort. So what does it mean to be a Christian? It means to put our faith in the work of Jesus. Well, what's, what's the work of Jesus? That he came to earth, that he lived, that he was crucified, that he was resurrected, and he ascended into heaven. And he sent the Spirit of God that now lives inside of us. This is the gospel. This is what we believe, and it all hinges around a very uncomfortable moment. You see, if we're not careful, what will happen is we'll, we'll sing songs about the uncomfortable moments of Jesus while we live in the very comfortable moment of us. Let me ask you a question this morning. Can you tell me one thing in life or one thing in the life of faith that is completely comfortable? Can you think of one thing in the life of faith that is absolutely and completely comfortable. I can't. Because it all requires faith in us to step out into a place that we're not familiar with. Faith thrives in holy discomfort. The greatest moments uh, in life can often result from some of the most uncomfortable decisions that are being made. Uh, always remember this. Nothing worth having comes without a cost. Nothing worth having comes without a cost. Because faith will thrive in holy discomfort. Number two, write this down. Our purpose in life is for God's glory. Our purpose in life is for God's glory. At the end of it all, our lives were and are designed to bring glory to God. That's why we've been created as his sons and his daughters. If we forget about the glory of God, then we won't be willing to pay the, the price of whatever it is that God's calling us to step out into. That's, that's the way it was for David. He had to live out a life of faith. Was David perfect, by the way? Absolutely not. David made mistakes, but he knew what it meant to repent and get back up. He had to step out in faith. In chapter 17, verse 45 and 46, it says that David said to the Philistine, the giant, he said, you come to me with the sword, with the spear, and with the javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and wild beasts of the earth. And here it is, 
that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Why was David doing what he was doing? Because he was so sure of himself? No. Was it because he already knew what the outcome was going to be? I don't think so. I see in the Word of God where God told him to go and step out in faith, and that's why David says that all the earth may know that there is a God in heaven. Translation, it's all about God. God was going to get the glory. Our purpose in life is for the glory of God. So if you're facing a difficult time right now, you're going through a season that's difficult, know this, whatever it is you're going through, if you lean into Him and you ask Him and you step out in faith, God will get the glory. And you will receive the blessings because of that. You see, the Israelite army was very comfortable. <clears throat> now, I know that might sound kind of different because you say, Pastor, they're at war. They're out of battle, right? Every day they're, they're worried. They're, they're anxious. They're threatened. Yeah, they are. But they're not doing anything. They, can't, they found themselves stuck for 40 days in a place of comfort. They had tents. They had weapons. They had armor. They had a war cry. But they were not moving. Why? Because they were comfortable. See, the point of life is not to think about me and mine. The point of life is supposed to be about thinking about you and yours. When it comes to distributing the glory of God, it's not to think about me and mine, but to think about you and yours. Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 9 through 11, tell us this. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and those in heaven, and those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So even God is promoting Jesus where he says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Why? For the glory of God. It's all about giving God the glory. So when you're facing the giant of glory, remember, our purpose in life is to give God glory glory. Number three, when facing the giant of comfort or going through a difficult season in life, make sure you do this. Number three, we must align ourselves with God. We must align ourselves with God. If you're finding yourself stuck because you're unwilling to get out of that comfortable place, align yourself with God. Because as soon as you align yourself with God, you'll be in that flow of what His Holy Spirit is doing. You can trust Him for the outcome. You don't have to worry about it because if God said it, he'll do it. But we resist when we get uncomfortable. We resist when we feel like, well, I don't think this is going to make me feel too good. And, and then that, that stops the flow of the blessing of God in your life. So when you're facing that place of discomfort, align yourself with him. <clears throat> Let me put it in these terms. Many of us drive cars. We're blessed to have a vehicle. Uh, no matter how good your vehicle is or is not, when your car is out of alignment, you know it, don't you? Because you can let go of the steering wheel, and if it veers to the left or it veers to the right, that means there's something wrong. There's something between the tires on the road and the steering wheel in your hand that you spend your life. And I don't know anything more annoying than when my car's out of alignment, and I've got to, I've got to turn a quarter of a turn just so I can go straight. Uh, number one, that wears on the tires quicker, right? So you're spending more money. Uh, number two, it's just annoying to have to do that. So what do you do? You go to the shop, and somebody will align the steering so that the tires on the road match the steering wheel in your hand, which brings more ease in the journey that you're on. So it is in our walk with Christ. If we will just align ourselves with his word and his promises, we won't always feel like we're resisting or like we're going against something. We can just flow in what it is the Holy Spirit is doing. God is calling us to align ourselves with him and his word. In other words, let me ask you this question. What is going to be the standard in your life? What is going to be the standard in your life? Because if God and his word is not the standard, you'll always live a life of discomfort because you'll be living for yourself. You'll be worrying about from one paycheck to the next. You'll be worrying about the next job. You won't pour your heart into what it is that God has you doing because you're already thinking about the next thing. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with thinking ahead. There's nothing wrong with planning. But if it's because you're uncomfortable, then th that's, that's not a good feel. See, it's easy to point out others and address uh, the standards that others should have. 
But what's the standard that you and I are going to follow? Are we willing to align ourselves with God and with His Word? Or are we going to continue to attempt to give everyone everything? Be people pleasers. Kind of blown around by the wind. And, and, and we live life based on how we feel. If it feels good, do it. I tell you what, if that's your life's motto, you're going to live a completely miserable and, and a life of discomfort. Because if it's based upon how you feel, it will change all the time. But when it's based upon faith, then you have the standard of the Word of God in your life. You see, the invitation for each of us is not to come and follow our neighbor or follow our fellow believer. It's to follow Christ. That's what He calls us to do. God does not call us to avoid the danger of a lost and dying world. He leads us into it with the sword of the Spirit. Uh, Andy Stanley, maybe you're familiar with that name and have heard him, uh, the son of Charles Stanley. Andy Stanley um, made a comment, and he said this, We don't end up where we hope to end up. Our lives ultimately end up wherever our path is headed right now. Uh, it's the principle of the path. You can wish upon a star, and you can hope, and you can pray that your path ends up in, in a place you just wish it will be, but it's not going to end up there unless you're actively doing something to engage your faith and to trust the Lord, and then to step out in faith and do what God is telling you to do. See, we must be diligent about who and what we align ourselves with, because whatever or whoever we saddle up with is going to determine where we arrive months from now and years from now. If we hope to have a life uh, that is surrounded by good people and financial stability, but we're hanging around all the wrong people and we're spending our money on all the wrong things, I'll guarantee you in a month, in a year from now, you're not going to have that financial security and you're not going to have that relational security because of the path you're choosing right now. So I ask again, what's the standard that you're going to set for yourself today? Number four, when facing the giant of comfort, uh, remember this, in the grand scheme of eternity, life is short. Life is short. If we get penned down by comfort, and we just live life saying, I'm just going to get by. Now, don't, now remember, don't get me wrong, it's, it's good to live a comfortable life. I'm not here to say comfort is bad. Comfort is good. I love comfort. But if God's telling me to go left, and I choose to go right because left looks more uncomfortable... I've now aligned myself with the standard of Jim, not the standard of God. And I've got to remember in this life, in the grand scheme of eternity, life is very short. I don't have time to, to fiddle around with the kingdom of Jim. I need to listen to the kingdom of God and get my perspective and my focus uh, on him and on his word. Remember, always remember, life is is short. I don't know about you, but I've learned this. I remember when I was young, um, I felt like, man, I'm, I'm 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, um, and I thought, life is going so slow. I'll never grow up and become an adult. It's going to be years, you know, for, and then all of a sudden I hit 16, and then, then next I know it's 18, and then I'm 21, then I'm 25, and somewhere after 30, you just lose track, and it seems like life picks up speed. You know what I'm talking about? The older you get, it seems like life just goes faster. In the grand scheme of eternity, life is short. We've got to hear what the Lord is speaking to us. The Israelites wasted 40 days sitting on a hillside. They had the power of God. They could have moved forward, but they didn't. What's the danger for us if we get stuck on a hillside, unwilling to go like the Israelites were unwilling to go? What's the danger for us? Well, the danger is we might do the same thing that the Israelites did. They said things like, well, we'll go next time. Or they'll say things like, oh, I've always got time. Or when I get enough money, when the kids are out of the house, when I'm finished having fun, after I'm married, when life gets easier. By the way, if you're waiting till life gets easier, you're never going to step out. When it's more logical. You see, God is breaking into our lives today. And he empowers us to see the giant of comfort fall in our life. The battle's already won. If God is calling you into a new season of life, lean into him. Step out in faith. The battle is already won. Complacency is not about what we own or don't own. 
It's cultivating and, to uh, and tolerating an off-target heart. Complacency springs from the root of me that says we should protect what we have because we've earned it. I've shared it before, but I'll call it today the, the giant of comfort gives us this principle that says get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can. Uh, Tony Evans had said that, if you've ever heard of Tony Evans. That's the giant of comfort in a nutshell. Get all you can, can all you get to keep it for yourself, then just sit on the can and hoard it. It's all about me. The problem with that is, is you become takers instead of givers. And in God's kingdom, he's looking for givers, not just takers. The goal of our faith isn't to settle into a nice, comfortable job or a nice, easy routine. The goal is to say simply these three words. Are you ready for them? God, I'm available. If you would say those three words to him and mean it, God, I'm available. And you open up the doors to let God show you what the next step is. It can be a little scary at first, but know this. God never is going to bring anything harmful your way. Jeremiah 29, 11, he has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. And he will bring it to fruition. But we must trust him. Complacency, it leads us into inaction. But worship moves us into action. So I encourage you, if you're facing those times of doubt, worship the Lord. Because it's in worship that we move, we move forward and we start seeing what God has. I wonder, I wonder today that the greatest regret any of us will ever know is that of standing before Jesus, knowing that we lived too safe of a life, too comfortable, too short-sighted, realizing we were just gluttons for pleasure when we were supposed to be lean warriors for freedom for Jesus' name. You see, faith is never just about us and our lives. Faith is about benefiting people we don't even know. That's what it means to be a Christian, to be a giver, not a taker, to look for opportunities that the Lord opens up. And that's going to require us to go to some uncomfortable places. Then we can accomplish the will of God. You see, a whole nation was made free because of the faith of one person. There might be a nation that's waiting on you today. Maybe there's a family that's waiting on you today. Maybe it's children in a classroom that are waiting on you today. Or maybe it's even another country that's waiting on you to lean into the standard of the Word of God and not the giant of comfort. I encourage you today to move in faith, and God will always breathe life into your journey. Amen.